Hi everybody, this is Fide Master Dennis Montacrucis, and today we're going to do our second show where I answer viewer questions. Uh, so I got through, I think, the first 15 or 16 or so questions in the last um, last time I did this. It wasn't the last show, but the uh, last time I did it. And uh, this time I hope to get through the rest that have been asked so far. So let's uh, go ahead and start here. Um, first question comes from Chess Monkey, and he says this. I'm rated about 1800 USCF. What's the best way to learn a new opening? Uh, for example, should I study a variation a week or two or three more, uh, two or three or more weeks in depth? Study all variations superficially at first and then go back in more detail. So that's the first part. And the second part is um, about keeping fresh about the openings you already know. Uh, it says, for example, I play the King's Indian Defense, and although I encounter the main lines once in a while, it's not that frequent. And some side lines, which are very sharp, like the four pawns, only come up maybe twice a year but one slip can be fatal. Okay, so how do we learn a new opening and what do you do to review them? Uh, there are a number of ways you can tr try to learn a new opening. I mean, one thing that I would suggest, uh, well, I'd suggest maybe a couple of different uh, ideas here. One is that you just uh, just play it. Just have some fun, play it in blitz, see what happens, and, and then kind of learn from, from your mistakes. But a more more rigorous way to do it would be something like this. So I would say uh, find some player who plays the lines that you like, and make a, a database of their games and go through them, see what they do. And from that kind of by osmosis, as it were, you get to learn what some of the main lines look like, uh, the patterns that uh, are common to those lines, the main plans, and so on. And then from there, I would say, if you've got a book on that opening, just go through the main lines. Uh, nothing really super specific. You know, You don't have to memorize everything. And uh, anyway, so with, with those two bits of information behind you, or those two, let's say, um, introductory procedures behind you, then start to play it in Blitz and um, just see how it goes. And from there, as you make mistakes, you know, as things go wrong, then learn the fine points. But I would say that the key thing is just to get a good general sense of what the main development plans and then strategic ideas those variations are. And you can get that, again, by creating a database of, of um, games played by strong players or the strongest players in that opening or within sub-variations. Um, but anyway, I would say go, in, go at it from that route. So start, start generally and then taper into the, uh, or let's say fine grain into the more specific uh, information as you get some experience and as you uh, see problems arising from your own blitz games. Okay, um, and then about maintaining what you know, uh, I would just say periodically review it. I mean, there's not really anything more to it than that. Uh, if you're playing blitz regularly, you know, not, not that you should make not that you should make blitz by any means your uh, first and main source of study, but some blitz from time to time, especially to uh, to keep sharp on what's happening in your openings, is uh, is a very good idea. So I, I think. If you're reviewing the uh, the openings from your Blitz games, you know, that doesn't take very long. You could spend maybe, uh, you know, five, ten minutes at the end of the day, maybe a little bit longer if, if necessary, just making sure that you played it right, played the opening right. So I think if you're doing that and you're playing Blitz on a fairly regular basis, that'll probably keep you sharp. I mean, you'll see, for example, the uh, the four pawns attack more than twice a year if you're, if you're playing Blitz. So I, I would just suggest that. But, you know, you can also, I mean, you should have little database files with your, your opening repertoire worked out, kind of like your own personal ECO or MCO, and, um, and, and review that before a tournament. Okay, next question from, uh, I'm not sure, oh, from Sengi, I think. And he asks, what do you think is better, a tactical style or a positional style? Uh, I'm inclined to think that there's really... I'm not sure that there, first of all, is any such thing as a tactical style or a positional style uh, because you, you just can't play chess without both legs. I mean, if if you had a computer that could calculate, let's say, six, seven moves perfectly but had no positional understanding whatsoever, it wouldn't be too hard to beat it. I mean, it would play moves like H4, you know, A4 as regularly as it plays moves in the center of the board. So, um, you know, there's just, just really no... Uh, no no way of getting around being able to play to some extent um, both positionally and tactically I mean it's it's uh, it's just the way the game works now if you mean 
uh, a style whereby you're going for especially complicated positions versus one where it's uh, it's a bit calmer. Well, I would just say it's there again. There isn't a better style, but rather what you should do first of all is uh, I, I wouldn't say you should try to cultivate any style at all. I think uh, the way style works is that it, it comes from who you are. It's not something that you kind of put on like 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 clothing. So just given your own your own tastes, your own understanding, you're naturally going to play a certain way, and, and I don't think there's any any reason to uh, to avoid that. Um, but you shouldn't, let's say, try to, uh, to to create a style. I mean, you, you just play how you play. Now, what you should try to do is figure out what your style is and then tailor your openings based on that. So, you know, you may admire a player like Mikhail Tal or Kasparov or, or Topalov, but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have the ability to play the kinds of positions that they play as well as you can play other kinds of positions. So I don't mean that you can play them as well as those guys do, but I mean you might admire it, but you might really flounder when you're in those kinds of unclear positions. And if so, then you should structure your opening repertoire to avoid that kind of position. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't work on on playing complicated positions, or let's say if your style is the other way, if you really seem to do better in complications than you do in quiet positions, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, try to learn anything at all about more quiet, um, strategic types of positions. You, you certainly should. But as a rule, I mean, you should always aim to maximize your strengths rather than to uh, to try to do everything in chess or to play like your favorite player if uh, that's not where your, your gifts lie. So that's my advice there. Okay, next question from Spatry or Espatry. Uh, my question is about how to think during a chess game. I realize that there may be no universal best way. Each person may have his or her own best way. But can you su suggest one way that I can use to structure my thinking during a game? For example, let's suppose that my opponent has just made a move. Is there a sequence of steps I can go through at every move? Do you check tactics first or check potential threats? Then go back to my plan and see if it's still good in light of the opponent's move. I've been trying to use the following sequence. Check tactics first for myself as well as my opponent. King safety and then pawn structure. What do you think? Well, honestly, I think it depends on on your strength. If you're a player who um, is relatively inexperienced tactically, um, if you remember the last show, I, I kind of said suggested that there were maybe three broad stages in a, a player's tactical career. So the first is where you get over the point where you're you're hanging things. And then the second stage is where you're developing what I called, I think, fundamental tactical competence. Something where, okay, if there's a basic skewer combination or, you know, a back rank or, a, you know, a pin, fork, you know, any of these kind of uh, standard tactical elements that you see in most combination books, uh, if you're still working through that, then I would say, yeah, it's reasonable to, to kind of explicitly ask if there are various tactics present in the position. But otherwise, I would say not really. Uh, I think, generally speaking, you'll have a sense, once you've reached that stage, of whether there should be something tactical. And if you have that sense, then by all means, look. But you'll, you'll kind of know to look. Um, one thing that I think you, you certainly should do, uh, absolutely, is to ask yourself, what, what's, the point of, what's the point of my opponent's move? I mean, unless it was something obvious and you had, you had already expected. Uh, that's almost invariably a, a good thing to do. To just try to figure out what what is my opponent up to, what's what's the plan, and you know, and then decide: Do I want to try to prevent this? Do I need to worry about it, or should I just get on with what I was doing? So, at any rate, I would say how you approach this depends on how strong you are, what kind of player you are, what kind of position it is. But um, as a general rule, to ask yourself what your opponent is up to, I think is uh, a, a very good way to to proceed and. Uh, it's a fundamental chess skill. You know, this idea of prophylaxis in chess, preventing what the opponent is up to, is uh, really a, an important thing. And the sooner you develop that kind of skill, the uh, the better it will be for your chess. Okay, the next question is one that I don't really understand. It's from uh, Advance, and he says, "What is a good opening reaction other than uh, sorry? What is a good opening reaction against c5 other than Sicilian?" Well. If you mean e4, c5, that just is the Sicilian. So um, 
I, you, you, you can't avoid a Sicilian. It just is a Sicilian at that point. So I, I'm possibly misunderstanding it, and you know, you can just ask again and make it clear for next time. Okay. Next question comes from Rapsode from Paris, and here's what he says. I'll try to make this question not overly abstract. It basically concerns how to defend against kingside attacks. I'm getting much more solid positionally, but I still find myself panicking and being mated occasionally by surprise frontal kingside assaults. He says he's around 1750. More specifically, it's quite common to hear the piece of advice, don't move the pawns in front of your king during a kingside attack, as this only gives the attacker points in the defense to latch onto and then break open. But it seems in many situations that white throwing his a-pawn down the board to a4 should be met by an immediate a5. I think he means h4 and h5 maybe. Uh, maybe not. Oh, anyway, he says, perhaps this sometimes occurs in some older variations of the dragon defending against the Yugoslav attack. And that's what makes me think he means maybe h4 and h5. Uh, in any case, he says, my brief question is, are there any general defensive principles to keep in mind here or does it just vary too much according to the position? If there aren't any general, generally applicable rules to defending kingside assaults, uh, pawn assaults, could you show perhaps one or two situations of a frontal kingside assault where the defender handled the defense extremely resourcefully? Well, um, uh, if the question is just about um, kingside assaults in general, then there's maybe one thing to say. If it's about pawn assaults, generally speaking, then maybe something else. So let's let's take uh, kingside assaults in general. And I was going to show a quick game with this, although, well, in some ways it, it, it um, gets at what he's asking, in other ways not. So um, if, if the question is just limited to something like these H4, H5 attacks, then I, I probably chose a, a poor game here. But, okay, let, let's address the, this dragon main line very briefly. I mean, we'll, we'll notice, so let me flip this around here. Okay, so we'll get to the mainline position here. And I mean here it's just terribly uh, unspecific. Or I, I should say it's all specifics really. Okay, so here for example. Uh, in this position, black has two fundamentally different ways of treating the position, and, and both are playable. Uh, well, at least two ways. But uh, facing a basic choice. I mean, white's idea is to play h5, of course, and pry open the h-file and go for mate. Um, of course, it's, things have gotten far more sophisticated, and there's just insane amounts of tactics. But anyway, black can can ignore this. And I mean, there's some super sharp lines there where he survives, although it's complicated and white pride does maybe get a little advantage. And black can also play h5. And this slows down the attack, but of course when white plays g4, there can be even more lines ripped apart on the king side uh, in the long run. So, you know, with, with something like the dragon, you just gotta know some theory. I mean, actually a lot of theory uh, if you're going into these mainline Yugoslav attacks. But Generally speaking, I mean, you know, you have that kind of fundamental choice. I mean, sometimes you allow h5 um, in some kind of fee and kettle positions. Not this, obviously, but, you know, because he just loses a pawn. Sometimes you can play with, like, h6. Again, not here. I'm not giving dragon advice at the moment. But, again, some fee and kettles, you can play h6, and then I'll meet h5 with g5 to, uh, to keep lines shut. But whether you allow h5, you stop it, or, uh, you know, and how you stop it, can, can just vary from, from situation to situation. There's um, a variation of the English attack that Vessel and Topolov has popularized. Uh, let me make sure I remember what I'm doing here. Yeah, and then here, h5. So Topolov has played this something like 15, 16 times with, uh, or maybe even more than that, with, you know, decent results. And the idea of h5 is to prevent White's standard g4 g5 idea here. Does it create a weakness? Well, it does to some extent, but it has this prophylactic purpose and, and succeeds in, in preventing g4, or at least making it very difficult. One other comment about pushing the h-pawn defensively. Notice that when the pawns are in their sort of you know ideal defensive formation, they guard these three squares in front of them can include e6 too if you want. So they control all four of these squares. 
Well, notice that after you push the h pawn, all four of these squares are still controlled. So that's uh, you know one kind of nice asset of pushing the h pawn is that you're not really you're not creating any new weaknesses by doing so. Um, uh, the pawn itself maybe could be weak at some point, and maybe the g5 square is slightly weakened because now if white puts a piece there, there's nothing we can kick it away with. But, um, you know, it's not as as huge a commitment as it might seem at first, pushing the h-pawn one or two squares. So, you know, by way of uh, general advice, I mean, I just have to say it, it really depends on the specifics. You know, you shouldn't be paranoid about pushing pawns in front of your king, but... You know, it's got to be a good reason, and, and determining what's a sufficient reason is just something that, you know, you learn over time. Um, let me give a, present a game that shows that, okay, this this is, a, it's not a dragon game, and there's no h-pawn, but it does show a kind of, a, I think, cool defense against uh, what looks like a, a very threatening white approach. So this was played in the National Open earlier this year, in 2008. And uh, my opponent was Carl Hassler, who was a master. And um, let's have a look. Okay, so so he plays this b3 setup. And when I was preparing, I saw he likes to do this a lot and to to try to go for an attack. I mean, he'll often play like uh, knight e5 and f4 and go for kind of a Nimzo Larsen style uh, build up. So okay, I played bishop to g4, bishop b2, e6, bishop b2, knight b to d7 castles. Okay, and now knight to d4. And I knew this was coming, and um, nevertheless, I, I wasn't too concerned. I, now, I realized certainly that I needed to defend in this position, that he was going to try to create some kind of kingside play, but I also felt very confident about my position. Okay, so I took and castled, and now he plays f4. So this um, gives him control over the e5 square, more to the point perhaps, he wants to play something like rook f, well, not rook f3 right away, but uh, g4, g5, rook f3, rook h3, queen h5, and just bludgeon me to death on the king side. And I can imagine when you're when you're saying that, you know, you, you sometimes panic in the face of these these attacks, that this is the kind of position that that perhaps would produce uh, that kind of panic in you. Okay, well let's figure out what black ought to do. Now, because White has this pawn on f4. It means he's got more space on this portion of the board. So these three files here. So in the h, g, and f files, White has a space advantage. But by pushing to f4, he's weakened the e4 square. I can put a knight in there. And if he plays d3, well, that's going to weaken the e3 pawn. So that I don't necessarily mind either. Now, uh, another thing is, okay, White's plan is not only to shove these pawns down down my throat, but also to play knight to f5. So that clears the diagonal for his bishop, and it's putting the knight on an aggressive square, and he's going to kick my bishop. So everything looks pretty good here. Okay, well again, my trumps, I've got the e-file, I've got more space in the center, and I've got the e4 square, unless he wants to weaken e3. So I play rook to e8. I think this is a good move with the point that now I can drop my bishop back to f8 uh, at leisure. So he plays knight to c3, developing. I play bishop to f8 preemptively, g4. Okay, so here he comes. And now I want to have a knight on e4. So I play knight c5, and now knight f to e4. So that way if he takes, I can take back with the knight. I could consider taking back with the pawn, but the thing is if I take with the pawn, while I get the d3 square for my knight, I'm afraid that this knight could just turn out to be a, an ornament rather than uh, a particularly useful piece. So I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I think this is a reasonable way to proceed. My pawn being on e4 also stops the rook lift. Whoops, not to f4, but to f3 and h3. So there is something to be said for this approach, but I would have probably taken with the knight and, and played essentially as I do in the game. So at any rate, to avoid at least this possible approach with the uh, the pawn taking the square away from the rook he plays rook to f3 and now once again I mean this might look like a, a kind of a panicky situation I mean should I play g6 here and bishop to g7 you know and I mean so that'll stop queen h5 but maybe he can play let's say okay if, if g6 rook h3 uh, maybe he can play queen e1 h4 
All right, so I thought about this, and I thought, okay, maybe I can play h5, and after g takes h6, play king h7, and block everything up, or at least try to. But I found a better approach than all of this. So in this position, made a nice, very nice, I think, move. Simply queen to d7. And this really messes him up. He can't play rook to h3 because the rook would hang. And if he were to play something like king to g2, queen to g4 check, again, just destroys the coordination here. So with this simple prophylactic move, I'm again making him take more and more time. I'm making it harder and harder for him to actually get his attack off the ground here. Okay, so he plays king to h1. And now I swap off my superfluous knight. And further, I now play c5. And notice that his knight can't get to f5 either. So that's another benefit of the move queen to d7. Okay, so now he retreats to c2. Now I play queen to f5. And so this clogs him up even more. So now there's no f5 and g6 that I have to worry about. Uh, furthermore, I'm at least indirectly eyeing this knight on c2. So something like knight takes g5 could be a threat, followed by queen c2. Um, and, okay, my queen is just very well placed in general. All right, so he plays knight to e1, sidestepping this tactic, and he's got the idea of slowly reloading with knight to g2, knight to h4, and then the f-pawn is maybe free to go, and he can put the rook on g1 and play g6, and, again, try to, try to kill me here. All right, unfortunately, again, this takes quite a bit of time, and I get to make moves too. So I play rook a to d8, Finishing my development, centralizing further. He plays knight to g2, and now I play c4. All right, so what does this do? Well, a uh, couple of ideas here. One is that I'm perhaps getting ready to play d4 in some variations. Uh, also, there's the idea of knight to c5, and then my knight may jump into d3. Uh, also, again, the d4 trick is uh, coming into play. So. I'm really going to crash through in the center here faster than he's going to get anything done on the king side. And notice as well that if he plays knight to h4, this, whoops, knight to h4, this really just doesn't do anything because I can, again, attack the, the, uh, the knight. And where's it going to go? It's got no place to go. It's not easily defended. I mean, if he goes to e1, then I have knight takes on d2. So this is uh, just not getting anywhere. So he plays rook to g1 first. And now he's got the idea of playing knight to h4. Okay, well, again, no panic. I play knight to c5. And now if he plays knight to h4, uh, one, among other things I can play are queen to e4 with the idea, okay, I'm first of all threatening to win the pawn here on b3, but I'm also pinning this, and I'm prepared to play d4. So again, just crashing through. Uh, another threat might be knight to d3, hitting the bishop, and then when that's protected, to play knight takes f4, exploiting the pin along the e-file. So white really isn't getting anywhere here. Plays bishop to d4. Okay, so I take, and now I take again. Little combination here. He plays bishop a7. I play rook to a8. I play bishop to b6. And now after rook to a6, we see all of a sudden that he's got a, a serious tactical problem. His bishop's under attack, and there's no really convenient way for him to defend it. Actually, I think queen to b5, um, yeah, the queen to b5, then I have queen to e4. And after bishop to c7, which is what he chose in the game, I play knight to d4, forking the queen and the rook, and of course the e-pawn is pinned. So I'm just winning material here. He took the rook, which I had seen. I play knight takes f3, attacking both his rook and the queen. He plays queen takes b7. Queen to h3, so important move, which forces him to cough up the f-pawn, so that way his bishop covers the mate, but now I just take, and then I take this, and then queen to d3, attacking the d-pawn and keeping my queen in the heart of his position, and here my opponent resigned. So this was uh, a game I was quite happy with, and um, but I think it's a good illustration Again, of uh, a very nice active defense. Notice that I followed the, the standard prescription that when your opponent attacks on the flank, that you counterattack in the center. It doesn't always work, but it's, uh, it's a good rule of thumb and certainly one of the first things that you should look at when you're under pressure in that way. 
Notice that I never had to push any of my pawns on the king side, and in fact never had to really make an explicit, an explicitly defensive move at all over there. I was able to slow down his threats with uh, some little tricks like queen to d7 earlier in the game, and then my own play in the center was faster than his. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, I'm not sure that I was able to really specifically help you with the, uh, let's say, the h-pawn advance, but um, as far as general defensive strategies go, I hope this was helpful. Okay, next question, a um, little, uh, little diffuse. Okay, so uh, Corn Raid asks, which books, if any, would you recommend in the following categories? Okay, and then the first is uh, just general literature revolving around chess. Um, and one of the things he points out is, okay, Stefan Zweig's um, Schach Novel. And, um, yeah, I mean, Nabokov wrote about chess. You know, it's the famous illusion defense. But uh, I'm not really the most um, apt person to ask about that. You might want to contact Edward Winter uh, from the, the Chess History site. You know, we'll browse his site and uh, maybe ask over there. The next one is uh, Chess History with a focus on history. Um, and there I would just say, well, depending on, okay, if you mean really old history, then, I mean, I would say McFarland has published some of the best books there. I mean, there's books on Amos Byrne, and there's this gigantic volume on Alyekin. But, you know, for just general uh, chess history books, Kasparov's are, are certainly excellent. I mean, for the chess analysis as well as uh, a general discussion of all of the world champions. So, Kasparov's My Great Predecessor series would be a pretty obvious choice. Okay. Um all right, let's go on to another question. This is from Kitty Got Sued. He wants to know my, or she, wants to know my all-time favorite game and my all-time favorite combination. And uh, asking both about all players ever and my personal best. Well, uh, for this I would say you should go hunting on my blog, which is at chessmind.powerblogs.com. Um, I don't think I've played an all-time favorite game, but some of my favorite games I've, I've presented over here on, on chess videos. So if you look at some of the uh, the games here, you'll definitely find some of my favorites. Um, certainly one of my favorites is my win over Udasen from um, the New York Masters back in 2002, I believe. Um, I don't think I've presented that show here because I presented it on Chess Base once upon a time. But uh, I think you can find it pretty easily on the Internet if you look it up. So that would certainly rank up there. Um, one of the fun things about it, I had black and I ended up with three passed pawns on the seventh rank with one on the sixth rank uh, trailing just behind it. Uh, my all-time favorite game of anyone, uh, I really can't say. I mean, again, uh, if you look on the chess-based shows, I mean, I've presented hundreds of games that I really like, and, and I don't know that I have one particular favorite. Um, certainly I'm very fa partial to a lot of Tall's games. And, um, okay, Tall, Koblenz, one of the um, the uh, great Sicilian. Uh, it was a rouser. Tall had white. It was a training game he played between the two of them. And uh, Tall famously ended up with a queen on h8 at one point, a rook on h7, and a bishop on h6. So if you look up all that, you'll find the game. And I would certainly say that's one of my favorites. And I think it was the first um, game that I presented for... Actually, I think I presented that with Chess FM a long, long time ago. So I think it might have been the very first game that I ever presented in uh, a lecture series. Okay, uh, my all-time favorite combination, I, I believe I've presented that on my blog. It's uh, from a game that I think was fake, and uh, it's, I think, was it Kassanen and Koskinen? Um, yeah, let me see. I can probably set it up from memory, but I've, I've presented this before, so let me, let me see if I can set it up from memory here. Okay. Do, 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 do. King is here. All right, and white has some kind of absurd position. As I said, this game is almost surely fake. I've never seen the, the full game. Uh, let's see, where are the rooks? I think this is here. Not sure where white's other rook is, just offhand. So let's put some black pieces on the board. Yeah, Black's King is on A8. Really, as you'll see, it's extremely suspicious. 
in that location. Uh, what else? We've got a bishop here. We've got a knight on e3. White. Where is white's other rook? Most annoying. Okay, yeah, it's back at home, and white has a knight on b1. And I think this is everything. It's black to move. Make sure. Pretty sure this is it. Okay, so it's black to move here and and win, and I'll leave it to you to figure out the solution or if you get desperate to, uh, to put it in your chess engine. Okay, next question. Um, can you explain the role of creativity in chess? Actually, I'll, I'll present the answer to this. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and present it. So, of course, you guys can pause it as long as you want. Um, so here comes the solution. Okay, here it is. So the first move is queen takes b4 check, bishop takes b4. And now the thing is, okay, a takes b4 would be mate if it weren't for the queen, the queen defending on this diagonal. And knight to c2 would be mate if it weren't for the rook defending the knight. Now do we see a little intersection here? Oops, <laughs> there's the intersection point on d2. So what black does at this point is plays rook to d2. And although the rook can be taken no less than five different ways, uh, only one way even allows white to stay alive for one more move. And that's queen takes. Every other capture either allows uh, a takes b4 mate or knight to c2 mate. And in fact, there is no other way to defend against one or the other mate except for queen takes d2. But now the queen is overloaded. Okay, it has to stop knight c2 mate and it has to stop a takes b4 mate. Now, we don't play a takes b4 first because after queen takes b4, knight c2, the rook is back in business. So we play knight to c2 because the bishop on b4 has no backup defender. Once the queen's gone, that's it. So there's there's my favorite combination. And um, it's too bad it's fake, almost surely, but it is beautiful. Okay, next question from Veritas. Can you explain the role of creativity in chess? In your experience, what is the most impressive creative play? And is or does creativity only concern tactics and combinations? What about positional creativity? Well, uh, I, I think this is, again, too big of a question. I mean, one can write books about creative play, and in fact, people have written books about it. Uh, I would agree with your implicit comment at the end of the question, or the implicit remark uh, that is behind the last question, which is that, yeah, creativity is, is demonstrated in, in all forms of the game, in openings and endings and tactics and positional play, in... Um, in planning, I mean, it's it's just throughout. So, um, I mean, really, creativity is what you do when it's not something that you just know off the top of your head. Uh, I mean, we're all forced to be creative at some in some way, and um, you know, I mean, that's again, it's there's the more you know in chess, the better. But for all of us, from virtual beginner to world champion. The game is more than just the stuff that we know and that we can easily apply. And, um, you know, the more creative you are, obviously, the, the, the better you'll be. But, but you know, how do you cultivate this? Um, you know, it helps to know more. I mean, let's say, you know, it really depends on what your theory of creativity is. You know, some people take creativity to mean making something from nothing. I mean, in, in effect, that really is the... I think the etymology of, of creation, right? I mean, we, we say that God created, but when human beings um, make more human beings, it's procreation. So it's not creation in the literal sense. It's not out of nothing. There was stuff that was uh, already there, and it turns into a, another person. So if you view creativity as creating something out of nothing, making something out of nothing, I should say, then... It would seem to be something that you either have or you don't have. But if creativity is really um, more along the lines of procreation or making, then I would say the more that you know, the better off you are. 
because even if it's not a simple application, the more different kinds of things you know, the more uh, ideas you can have. So in part of creativity is taking an idea from one domain and applying it to a new domain, to something fresh. And there I would say what you can, the benefit of knowing a lot of chess, knowing a lot of different kinds of positions, having at least some familiarity with different kinds of openings, is that um, ideas from one position type might be imported into a new position and you can use it. And um, okay, I mean, I, I think I presented an example of that uh, last time that I was answering the viewer questions where I showed the um, the one game that I played against the 1800 with h4, h5, h6, and the bishop went in f6, and so on. And I found a really interesting way of applying it in what, in some ways, was a very different kind of position in that uh, the blitz game with the international master. So, no, I mean, creativity is just, you know, it's everywhere in the game. And, uh, again, it's tremendously broad, but hopefully my very sketchy rumina ruminations on the uh, on the matter might be uh, at least give give some guidance and some encouragement to uh, to know more chess rather than less chess okay next question from bystanders can you briefly discuss the benefits of playing slow and serious chess games okay and basically he says you know he's got a lot of uh, players who like to play blitz in his school club and uh, think that you can learn as much from chess from blitz games as from slow games and essentially, he wants to say that this is mistaken, and you know, but can I can I support that? Well, I, I think what you learn from from slow games and blitz games tends to be different, but but it's clear. I, I mean, I think the the biggest benefit that you get is from from the, the serious hard work and from playing, um, you know, slower slower games. Absolutely. The reason is that what blitz does. So he, the uh, his his schoolmates pointed out that okay grandmasters performances in blitz games and slow games are correlated. In other words, if you're a great player in slow chess, you're gonna be a great player in blitz chess. But the point is that what blitz is doing is it's more or less testing your reactions. Um, you know, it it reflects what you do. I mean, because you have very little time to think, so it's largely your accumulated knowledge. You're not learning in blitz you're not even generally figuring things out. I mean, sometimes you can, but not much of it because, again, there's just not that much time to think. So it's largely reaction, and reactions are always based on what you already know, you know, your your, your current abilities. And um, so th the value of blitz games is that it's a way of just getting your, you know, you get your mind active, you're, you're getting a little bit of practice in, um, and it's excellent for practicing openings and for, for kind of seeing what's out there. You know, what are what are the, the popular variations? What are the little uh, tricky lines that you got to look out for? And testing your understanding of your openings. But as a way of learning per se, it doesn't really do very much. Uh, it's not impossible to learn, but you're not going to learn very much from it. So it's, uh, you know, you learn by having to solve problems in chess. Okay, and solving problems requires, again, really delving into a problem and getting to the bottom of it and allowing these creative ideas to emerge. And in Blitz, there's much, much less of that. Not none, but it's uh, a lot less. Okay. So next question is from McClintock45, I believe. Okay. It says, my question may sound simple, but it requires an answer. I've been playing now for over six months. Um, I've made a video of my first win on ICC. That was a surprise to me. Okay, I've got a ring of around 900. Uh, I've played with Chess Master. I've gone through the teachings. Both some of uh, bought some of uh, Kasparov's great predecessors' books. Have a history of chess. And he says, but I just don't get it. Okay, and then he bought Roman's Lab openings, DVDs, and um, other stuff, and he doesn't get it. Okay, so essentially, what he wants to know is um, how and what to study, and uh, you know. How do you get better in, in, in effect? You know, what, what, do you, what do you do? Okay, if you're around 900, what I would say, there are a couple of things that you want to do. And, you know, the tough thing is the older you get, it's a bit harder to, to progress with tactics, but not at all impossible. Uh, it's, it's almost, you know, well, almost never. It's, it's, not, it's basically never too late to improve. 
uh, it's a little easier when you're younger because you, you have better vision, better board vision. Um, there, there have been studies that show, for example, that um, the number of objects. So if you remember Rain Man, you know, the, you know, the, the, match, the uh, box of matches drops and he's, or whatever it was, and he counts them immediately. You know, you can just see, okay, it's 127 or whatever it was. All right. Uh, none of us can do that, but kids can pick up a, a, a greater number than we can as, as we become adults. All right, so our, our ability to just, in a glance, um, see, you know, how many there are of whatever, where everything is, it, it slowly but surely diminishes. But that just means that it's tougher. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. Now, and the advantage that you have as an adult is that generally you're better at abstract thinking and grasping rules than, than kids are. So, you know, there's both aspects in chess. There's the, the particular, the concrete on the one hand, and then there's the general and the, um, let's say, the rule of thumb, the, the heuristic on the other hand. Okay, but what you need to do, when you're 900, the, as I mentioned before with the tactics, the first thing you got to do is get to the point where you're just not dropping stuff. Okay, so for that, just elementary tactics, um, you know, setting up positions, Put, let's say, um, a white queen in the middle of the board. Put a bunch of black pieces randomly scattered around the board. And as quickly as you can, try to figure out, okay, what pieces are under attack? What, what, what white pieces, or sorry, what black pieces could the white queen capture uh, if, it's, if it's white to move? All right, and just set that up, you know, that kind of thing up in various ways, with the rook, with the bishop, knight, pawn, different squares, different locations. You know, basically do things that uh, kind of, that are intended to, to kind of prime your ability to see the board quickly. Uh, do basic tactics. So there's this this big book by uh, by Polgar, by the, the dad, not by uh, any of the sisters. Um, Laszlo Polgar, I think it's just called Chess, and it's like 5,334 um, positions and combinations. And, okay, it starts off with just a 1,000 mates in one. All right, so stuff like that. I mean, really simple, but that gets your, your, your mind acclimated to these basic patterns and, and being able to just see these tactics immediately. That's just so fundamental. Um, there's a guy named Jeff Coakley. He's written a bunch of books, you know, winning blank for kids, so strategy, tactics, etc. Um, those aren't bad either, so you might want to take a look at those. But anyway, that's the first thing. You know, you just got to have this basic understanding, or not basic understanding, but basic vision of the simplest tactics and then you work your way up from there um, you know but, but worrying about openings and buying a whole bunch of opening DVDs is just almost pointless it's, it's not completely pointless but pretty close and, and the Kaspar of my great predecessors books are just way you know way past what you need to be worrying about so it's not that it's bad to look at them and to appreciate the game and you'll see you know okay you'll see what good play looks like but the level of sophistication that, first of all, the, the games demonstrate, and more than that, that Kasparov's notes are geared for. I mean, Kasparov's notes are geared for minimally pretty strong club players. And, um, you know, certainly not for 900. So there's nothing wrong with being 900, but, you know, you want to get the stuff that's, that's geared to you. So, you know, beginner-type books are really where you need to be. You know, opening theory doesn't matter. I mean, you just need to not get checkmated in the opening really quickly, but you know, as long as you don't fall for the form of checkmate or ver versions of that, and you know, you bring your pieces towards the center, you try to you know put a pawn or two in the middle of the board to to make sure you've gained some space, you castle your king to safely safety quickly. That's just that's more or less all you need to worry about at this point. You know, it's just developing, protecting your pieces, keeping your king safe, and Learning your tactics, um, that's really what I would say is uh, the most useful thing for you at this point. Okay, so I think I've gotten all the questions here. And hopefully, again, this helped. Uh, you guys will let me know if it did or not. And um, again, I hope to do this again at some point. And, um, but for now, I think the next few weeks, I I'm going to present some of my games from the uh, Norm I Am Norm tournament that I just played in, in Chicago this last week. And um, But by then, I think we'll have had a lot more questions uh, kind of come up, 
and hopefully this will be helpful again in the future. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great week.